So welcome everybody to our webinar today. Uh, I'm gonna to talk about IGP route filtering. Now there are a, as you probably know, a lot of different routing protocols and each one has a lot of different ways to filter things. So I'm gonna take the next, oh, hour and 15 minutes, hour and 20 minutes or so to get through as many as we possibly can. And I figured probably the most logical way to do this would be to start with the most well-known, well-implemented routing protocol. So I'm gonna start with OSPF which funny enough is probably the most difficult one to do route filtering with because it has all kinds of restrictions and constraints. But we'll start with that. We'll do that on Cisco and Juniper, taking our time going through that. And then with whatever time we have left, then I'll jump into EIGRP and we'll see where we go from there. So a couple things um, about this course. Like I said, um, if you have not taken a course from me before, here's my credentials. Uh, so if during the course of uh, our webinar today, you have any questions I just didn't have a chance to get to because there might be a ton um, or anything else, you've got my information. So you can reach out to me via email. I've got my Twitter handle there and my LinkedIn account. So feel free to use those uh, if you have any questions that were not answered today. And as Catherine said, in order to provide like some comparisons and contrasts, I'm gonna do all my demonstrations on both Juniper and Cisco equipment. And what's kind of cool is that the topologies and equipment I'm using are freely available to you guys. Um, so for Cisco, I'm gonna be using Cisco's DevNet sandbox environment, which as long as you have a Cisco account, which doesn't even require a purchase of anything, you just need to provide them your uh, email address, your blood type and your social security number. Well, maybe not all those, but you have to provide them your email. You can log in and access all sorts of different lab topologies. So I'm gonna be using one of them called the Cisco Modeling Labs Enterprise Environment to do my Cisco stuff. And then Juniper similarly has an environment that if you just register for it. Now with Juniper, once you provide your email and stuff, they have to approve you. I've never known of anybody not being approved, but just be aware that whereas Cisco is kind of like instantaneous approval with Juniper, if you wanna access their system, you might have to wait three or four days for them to come back and say, you're good. And then you can access the same Juniper VLAB that I'm gonna be using. So that being said, here are what we're gonna look at. Uh, so here's our Juniper topology. So if you want to, you might wanna take a quick screenshot of this, um, cause I'm not gonna be referring to this again. So when I'm in a particular router, like say, let's go into VMX2 or let's go into VMX6, you'll be able to see this picture in front of you and you'll know which diagram I'm talking about. So notice here also the layout. We've got OSPF area one, area zero and area two. So this is already pre-configured, all the IPv4 is configured. I've got RIP on here and I might be making some minor tweaks and modifications as we go along. So that is our Juniper environment. And if we get to ISIS, uh, this is how ISIS is gonna be pre-configured with two different areas and various level one, level two routers. So once again, we probably won't get to that today, um, but in case you're saying, oh man, I really want to learn how to do filtering with ISIS, don't fear, because I'm gonna show you in just a second, a course I created that has everything I talked about today and a whole lot more. So, and as far as Cisco, this is the Cisco uh, environment I've created in Cisco Modeling Labs. Once again, we got three different OSPF areas. We've got EIGRP over there on the right. So you might wanna take a screenshot of that as well. Uh, I've tried to create the Cisco topology to match as much as possible the Juniper topology. So you notice that the subnets are in the same place. The router names and numbers are, are virtually identical. Pretty much the only thing that's different is the actual interface names and numbers. That's that's a little bit different. And here's the Cisco ISIS topology once again, if we get to that. All right, so now that you've seen that, let me quickly show you, we don't need this anymore. So bye-bye. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm gonna be covering just a small sample in the hour and 15 minutes, hour and 20 minutes we have of what's fully contained in this course right here. Let me make sure, yeah, yeah, I am sharing, so you guys should be able to see this. So if you go to my.ine.com and in the search field, you just type in the keyword of filtering, you'll see this course, uh, which is a course that just came out about two or three weeks ago. And it's got everything I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna, in the course, it starts talking about how do you prove, how do you get access to the Juniper V labs? How do you get access to the Cisco Sandbox labs? So if you've never done that before, this course sort of walks you through that. 
And then I go through all the details here. And in here, what's also nice is at the very top, and you'll notice that pretty much all of our courses have this in the, in the right corner. I should probably bring up something where I can draw here, just a second. Boop, there we go. Um, so in the right corner, most of our courses have this course file section right there. And if you click on that, you download a zip file. And at a minimum, the zip file should have a PDF of what the PowerPoints are. And in this particular case, if you download this, that also, this also contains YAML files. And if you're not familiar with YAML files, that you can open them up in a text editor and you can see in there the pre-configurations that you will need for everything. As far as the Cisco YAML file is concerned, if you go to Cisco Modeling Labs, you can just click a button that says Import Lab. And if you import the YAML file that's in here, voila, you've got the lab topology already fully built, ready to go. Um, as far as Juniper is concerned, you can use Ansible or something to pre-configure all your devices with the YAML file. Or if you're not familiar with Ansible, just open up the Juniper YAML file in the text editor, and you can just extract from that, copy and paste the individual configs that go into each router. So that's right there. So with those course files that you can see, as you go through this course, you'll see a lot of videos start out with lab demonstration. And these are things you can do yourself. So uh, Cisco RIP filtering, for example, in that lab demonstration, I'll say, here's your topology based on the YAML file that you downloaded. Here's your objectives, one, two, and three. Pause the video, try to make this happen. And then you try to make it work on your side, then you can press resume on the video and I walk through it with you and I demonstrate how it works. So you can see all throughout here, there's lab demonstrations on Cisco and Juniper. So if after, if I've whetted your appetite with this particular webinar and you wanna learn more, I would absolutely recommend that you check out this particular course. Okay, so let's just talk first of all, real quickly about route filtering in general. First of all, who would wanna learn it? What's the purpose of it? Well, certainly if you are a network administrator or a network engineer, or you aspire to be one of those job roles, this is something that inevitably you will come across. Um, now, certainly you can turn on your routing protocol, OSPF, EIGRP, whatever it is, and just have it learn everything and have it select the best path. But sometimes you don't want to do that. For example, let's say I have a router that has two you know, northbound interfaces on it, and it's running some routing protocol. And just due to the nature of the routing protocol, this interface right here is always the preferred interface. The, the best routes are always learned this way. And even though you got a bunch of routes that were learned via this interface, that's not the best path. So all of your packets are going out here to get to wherever they need to go, which could result in this link getting congested and starting to drop packets because it just doesn't have enough bandwidth. Now, certainly you could choose to you know, upgrade this to a 100 gigabit link or something like that, or you could just use route filtering. You could say, well, I'm gonna take some of my routes of which I've learned them on both links, and I'm just gonna filter them off of this one. I'm gonna protect it all. And so when, once they're filtered, this will be the only path that's left. And now I can do load balancing by using route filtering. And that's just one example, right? You can also use route filtering for security purposes. Maybe there's a certain part of your network, you know, oh, those, those payroll people, they keep trying to hack my engineering lab because they think they're smart and they're screwing around with stuff. I wanna filter out the engineering lab's subnet so that payroll never sees it, so they can't even get to it, right? So you could use route filtering for security reasons. There's lots of reasons why you could use it, but I'm sure you've already got some reasons in your head, otherwise you wouldn't be watching today. Okay, so let's talk now about you. You're thinking in your head, okay, I need to implement route filtering for whatever reason you have. Now, before you actually sit down on the command line and start typing away, there's some decisions you have to make in advance. Like number one, what directionality do you wanna filter? Most routing protocols, they allow a choice of two things. Do you wanna filter on the inbound direction, which means I'm gonna jump on a router and I'm gonna prevent this router from learning something. So even if somebody's advertising to that router, he's gonna say, nah, I'm not listening to you. I don't hear that. So that's called inbound filtering, where the, the consequence is, even if a neighbor is advertising a route to you, you pretend like you never heard it. Now in some routing protocols like distance vector protocols like EIGRP and RIP, um, 
And BGP, now BGP is not distance vector, but BGP, EIGRP, and RIP, when you implement inbound route filtering, it's actually like the router never heard of that route in the first place. There's no table, there's no database where that route is stored. It's just ignored. That's inbound route filtering. OSPF is a little bit different because OSPF has this pesky little rule that if you send me a link state advertisement, I have no choice but to store it in my link state database and continue flooding it on. I have to do that. So inbound route filtering with OSPF means, yes, I'll keep that little LSA in my database, but I will prevent it from being translated into a route in my routing table. So the actual table I use to forward my packets, my Ceph table, my routing table, won't have that entry, even though in the back of my mind, I do have it in the link state database out there. So that's how inbound route filtering works in OSPF and ISIS, same type of thing, except with ISIS, we're talking about link state packets instead of link state advertisements. So that's inbound route filtering. Or maybe you want to do the opposite. You want to do outbound route filtering. Maybe I've got a bunch of routes and I'm going to, and my default behavior is to send all of them to you. And for whatever, for whatever reason, I decide, well, there's a certain subset of those routes that I don't want to send to you. So that would be considered outbound route filtering. On my side, I would configure a route filter saying, okay, when I'm doing an outbound routing update, exclude or filter these routes from that outbound update. So that's the first decision you as the network administrator or engineer have to make, inbound or outbound. Where do you, and where in your topology do you want to implement this? Next thing is, you have to be aware of whatever protocol limitations you're going to face. Now, with your EIGRP, your RIP, and your BGP, there pretty much aren't any limitations. Those protocols let you filter on any router, any direction, pretty much anything you want. Uh, it, it's wide open as far as what you can do with filtering. Now with OSPF and ISIS, you know, your, your link state protocols, they have a lot of limitations that they deal with. For example, we just talked about one of them. One of the big limitations in link state protocols is that if you and I are routers and we're in the same area, whether it be an ISIS area or an OSPF area, if I have a link state advertisement, or in the case of ISIS, a link state packet in my database, I have to give it to you. You and I have to have the exact same databases. Otherwise, the whole protocol breaks down, you know, it blows up, sends shrapnel into your face. It's not pretty. So with link state protocols, that means we have some severe limitations on filtering. For example, if we had 10 routers in the same ISIS area or in the same OSPF area, and let's say they all knew about, let's say in that area, there was a route of the 50.50 .50 network. And we said, well, for whatever reason, um, router five over there, I don't want him to know about that. I don't want him to even have the link state packet for that. You can't do that. There's nothing you can do on router five to configure an inbound or outbound filter so that he has no knowledge of that. He has to receive and store the link state advertisement or link state packet that contains that route. Now, what you can do on that router, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, is you can configure an inbound filter that says, okay, even though you've got that knowledge in your database, I'm gonna prevent you from translating that into a route in your routing table. Basically, you're not gonna be able to use that information that you got, okay? So, but that's, you know, because of that rule that every router and area has to have the exact same information in their database, that means you have to be very cognizant in both ISIS and OSPF about what routers can do filtering and where you can do it, so. And then the last thing you have to think about is what exactly do I want to filter on? Now, most people, when they think about route filtering, the first thing that comes to their mind is, okay, I want to filter on some sort of prefix or subnet. And absolutely, right? That's the easiest form of filtering. But you can filter on other things as well. For example, maybe you say, you know what? Um, I don't really care what the prefix or the, what the prefix or, or you know, subnet is, what I want to filter on are slash 32s, host routes. I don't want my router to have a single host route in its routing table. Now, in that case, what we're dealing with is we're filtering on the subnet mask. We're creating a filter saying, hey, permit any prefix as long as the subnet mask is a slash 32. You can do that. Or you can even filter on non-IP characteristics. For example, if I was running EIGRP, 
I could have a router saying, okay, I'm gonna filter out all EIGRP external routes. EIGRP internal routes are okay, but not external routes. Or maybe there's a route that's coming that has a tag value on it. I wanna allow a certain tag value in, but prevent other tag values from coming in. So that's the, that's the last thing you have to think about is, what do I want my router to look for, to lock onto to say, ah, that's what I'm looking for, kill that. I don't want that, or I don't want that sent out. So assuming you've already got all that stuff in your brain figured out, let's uh, just jump right into it here and start with OSPF. Um, you know, because OSPF is a, a standard routing protocol, it's not proprietary, and I think it's probably more widely used than ISIS, which is also a standard routing protocol, we're going to start with that, because probably most of you out there are using or will use OSPF. All right, so if you've got that topology diagram in front of you, let's uh, start, actually I'll bring it back up here for a moment. Where did it go? Right here. Okay, so not that one. Uh, right here, this one. No, we'll start with Cisco. Okay, so let's take a look at this and start with the various ways that you can filter OSPF. So let's start with what I call um, inter-area filtering, which means you've got some route, like let's say the 15 network here, which lives in OSPF area one. Normally router one and router three would learn about that either via a router LSA or a network LSA, type one or type two LSAs. And because these two routers here are area border routers, it would, it would be their job to then take the, the route out of those LSAs and put that into a type three summary LSA and inject that into area zero. And then router two and router four would receive that. And then it would be their job to create their own type three summary LSA that contains that exact same route, but they would list themselves as the advertising router and inject that into area two. So here's the first place where we could do some filtering. What if I say, hey, on my area border router, I don't want it to do that. In other words, maybe my area border router has learned about a route from one area, but I do not want him to inject that into an adjacent area. How do I prevent him from doing that? Okay, so with Cisco and with Juniper, there's a couple of different ways you could do this. So the first variable is which ABR do you want to do the filtering? So for example, if we're talking about the 15 network, that's what we're gonna filter out, okay? And let's say that um, I want, I don't want area zero or area two to know about the 15 network. Well then logically I would be doing my filtering on both router one and router three. Okay, so now we're talking about doing the filtering on the ABR that's physically connected to the area where this route lives. And this is a very important distinction because this command I'm about to show you for Cisco and Juniper only works on the ABR that's actually connected to this area. This command I'm about to show you, if I tried to do it on router two or router four, it would have no effect. It would take the command, but absolutely nothing would happen. All right, so this is probably actually the easiest command for filtering. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm gonna jump onto router one and first of all, let's confirm that he even has the 15 network. He should have that as a directly connected route. Let's move this over here. Okay, we don't need this anymore. All right, so router one. Okay. There we go. Enable. And I'll zoom in. I know it's probably kind of small right now. So show IP route. All right. So, so right there, we can see that that router is directly connected to the 10115 network. Now, doesn't matter that he's directly connected. Even if this route was somewhere else in area one, the fact is he's connected to area one. He knows of this route. Now, how do I have verification that he has created a summary LSA? Well, I can do show IP OSPF database summary, that's the type of LSA I'm looking for, and self-originate. Show me the type three LSA that you yourself have created since you are an area border router. 
this will show me all of them. And you can see right here, here it is. He says, okay, for area zero, when I inject into area zero, here's a type three I'm gonna inject into area zero and here's a type three. And this is the one I'm looking for, right? Link state ID 10115.0. He says, I am the one who created, I'm the advertising router. All right, so how do we get him to not create this? Well, it's real simple. So we go into his OSPF process and we use the command area one. Now, why the one here? Because this is where that route lives. So in this command, I'm gonna about to show you area one range, and then I'll complete it. Well, let's just go ahead and do 10, 115.0 and the mask. Now there's one more thing I'm gonna enter in just a second. Normally, this command is used for route summarization in OSPF. Like if you had a whole bunch of routes, 10101, 10102, 10103, and you want to coalesce them all into one summarized route and then advertise a summary LSA of just that one summarized route, that's what you would use this command for. But with one additional keyword, not advertise, it turns into a route filtering command. So if we parse through this command, this says, okay, I'm gonna look at my area one database. Now right there, that's why this command only works on routers that are connected to the area. If I did this, this command on router two or router four, they would say, I don't have an OSPF database for area one. I don't even know where that is. So it would have no effect. And he's gonna say, I'm gonna look at my area one database. I'm gonna look at my SPF tree and I'm gonna see if I can find on that tree there any route that begins with 10115. Now keep in mind, this is kind of generic. So in other words, this is saying, hey, any route that begins with 10115, that could be 10115.0, which is what I'm trying to filter. This will also capture 10115.32 slash 27, 10115.8 slash 29, right? Anything that begins with 10115. And this says, don't advertise. So it says, do not create a TSA for that route. So I'm gonna hit enter here, end. And now see if I can capture this real quickly here. Yes, see that? You gotta do this pretty fast, but see here it is. And it says the delete flag is set and the max age has been set. This is tells all of the routers in its area, hey, this LSA I previously gave you, it's bad. I'm setting the maximum age of one hour on it, which means you guys all need to purge it from your database. And if I do this command one more time, it's gone, right? Now the 15 route is gone. So show run section OSPF. So that command, once again, was the area one range command with the not advertise keyword. And like I said, be aware, be careful, because you might be filtering out more than you intended because this is not specific, right? This is not saying just 10115 slash 24. This is capturing possibly other things as well. Now, in order to fully make sure that area zero doesn't have this, I would have to do it on router three as well, okay? But I'm not gonna waste your time doing that, but I'm just saying right now, area zero will still have that route, but right now the only way they have it is through router three and that's it. Okay, so that's one way that we can filter inter area routes. Now, what if you said, okay, so here we are right now, right? This network is still in here and in here because this guy was the one who's now advertising it. It's been filtered from router one. Now, if you said, okay, but I don't want it in area two. In other words, it's okay for area one to have it. It's okay for area two to, or area zero to have it, but I don't want anybody in area two to have it. Well, that means we have to now perform our filtering on these ABRs. And that command I just showed you won't work right there because neither router two nor router four are connected to area one. So we need a different command for this, a little bit more complex. Now, the beauty about this next command I'm gonna show you is that, actually, you know what? Hold off for a second. I, I wanna go to the Juniper topology now and show you how to do exactly what I just did in Juniper's command line as contrasting with Cisco. So before we go to another feature, let's look and see how Juniper does it. All right, so with Juniper, we're gonna do the same thing, right? We got the 10115 network. We're gonna go onto our ABR, which is VMX1. So let's go over to that. And in this particular case, he is 
dot five. All right, so VMX one. So once again, let's let's verify that he has the route. Show route table inet.0. So that'll only show me the IPv4 routing table. And there it is. 10, 115 slash 32. Okay, right there. And here's a direct route, 10.115.0. And let's confirm that he's created a summary LSA. So the command is very similar. Instead of show IP OSPF database, it's just show OSPF database. And in Cisco, it, we were looking for summary LSAs. Here it's net summary. And then we want to do advertising router self. Okay, so that's the equivalent show command. And right there, we can see into area zero, he will advertise this, actually he already has, advertised that type three summary LSA. Okay, so what's the, the equivalent command here? So we want to do edit, or you could do configure, it'll get you in the same place. And we want to do set protocols, OSPF, area. And just like before, the area here has to be the area where that route lives. I could type in area one, or I could type in 0001. Either way, it'll, it'll take it. And then area dash range, and then 10, 115.0. Now, what's nice here about Juniper is you don't have to type in your subnet mask as dot a decimal, 255, 255, zero. I can just type in slash 24. And then the keyword I'm looking for is restrict. So I'll zoom in there real quick so you can see that command a little bit better. So that's the command I'm typing in into the Juniper router that does the exact same thing. And now enter, we got to commit that. All right, and now if we do show route table, well, show route table inet will still show it, but if we do show OSPF database, net summary, advertising router self, not elf, now we see in area zero, it's gone, right? He deleted his LSA for that. So that was the equivalent command of the area range command for Cisco, right there. Okay, so now let's go back to what we were looking at before, which was we now wanna to go to an ABR that is not connected, like router two. And we wanna say, hey, router two, you've just received a type three summary LSA from, well, it actually came from this guy in this case, came up that way, advertising the 15 network and uh, we do not want you to copy that. We do not want you to create your own LSA for that and inject it into area two. So let's go ahead and take a look at him. Okay, we need to go back here and go on router two. Okay, so once again, uh, first of all, check his routing table to make sure he actually has it show IP route, and we can just do show IP route OSPF, because if he has it, that's how he would have learned it. All right, and we can see it right there. There it is, 10.115, and he learned it as an OSPF inter-area route. Now, this is one thing that I kind of like a little bit better about Cisco than about Juniper, is that in Cisco routers, as you can tell, when you have some OSPF routes, the, the little key to the left actually tells you how it was learned like OIA, you know, that came from an area border router somewhere. That's in an area that you're not connected to. O, right, OSPF intra area route. That's a route that actually is in the area that I'm physically connected to. And OE, external route, some ASBR redistributed that. In Juniper's world, that's not the case. It just says OSPF and you kind of have to, well, I'll show you this just so you can contrast it. So here, show route, oh, I have to get out of this mode. Show route table inet.0. Okay, so, so you can see here, I'm on router one at this case. So for example, if we're looking at our topology diagram, 
let's go back to where we were. So right now I'm on this router, router one. Okay. The, let's see here, the 34 network, right? That would be just an O route in Cisco, an intra area. And there it is. It says OSPF. Now the 46 network over here on the right, and in a Cisco router, that would say OIA, inter area 46. But notice in this case, it still just says OSPF. So there's really no way of looking at this routing table to say which one of these is an intra, which one is an inter route. The only key it gives you to anything is, I think I have it somewhere in here, is an OSPF external route, which in Cisco would be OE. Here it says OSPF, but the thing that's different is the preference, or in Cisco speak, we call that the administrative distance. So if you see the number 10, that means this route either lives in your area or was given to you by an ABR. If you see 150, that means this is an OSPF external route. Now you might say, Keith, why do I care? What does this have to do with filtering? Well, it actually is very important with filtering because we'll see in a little bit that some filtering commands only work on OSPF external routes. So if I tried to implement a filtering command that we'll see later on, it would not work on this 100.3, 100.2, 100.4, but it would work on this 100.5 because that's an OSPF external route. So you have to be able to visually sort of tell the difference here by looking at these tables. Okay, so let's go back to router two. We're now focusing on the 15 network and we already proved that it was there. And similarly, I can prove that he created his own LSA advertising that show IP OSPF database summary self-originate. Aha, interesting. Okay, something is not right with him. Let's see here, show run. Why did you not create your own? I think I know what the problem is here though. This is real, I thought I already had this figured out. Just to tell you what's going on. So when you, I use the original YAML file that I do in my course that I just showed you. And then that IGP filtering course with the YAML file, area two does not exist. It basically, OSPF basically ends at router two and router four. So I thought I had modified that to have area two, but if area two doesn't exist, that's why router two doesn't have uh, any summaries because he is not an area border router. So let's just real quickly, interface range gigabit zero slash slash two, man, I really can't type, slash three, IP OSPF one, area two, end. Okay, and let's just make sure that we have at least one guy that he's talking to. Interface range gigabit zero slash three through four, IP OSPF one, area two, Oh, not Airy 21. Ah, okay, one of these days, I'll actually be able to get this right. No. Okay, show, and then lastly, we'll just real quickly do on the last router and we should be good to go. Okay, so now we should be we should be good. Let's go back to router two. Show IP OSPF neighbor. One, two, he should have a total of one, two, three, four neighbors. Uh, let's see here, he's got zero, 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 one. So he's not forming a neighbor relationship with zero, three. Show IP interface brief. What's going on with zero, three? It's up, up. Ping 10, 126.2. Okay, he can ping router six, probably because I just messed around with my, I fat fingered the configuration too much on router six, zero three and zero four. Uh, yeah, it didn't like it, didn't take it at all. Okay, that's fine. 
interface range gig zero slash three through four IP OSPF one area two. Okay, back to router two. Okay, show IP OSPF database summary self average self originate. There we go. Okay, took a little bit of time. And we should see in here da, 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 a little bit down below. Okay, there it is. So I'll zoom in a little bit for you guys. Whoops, wrong command. Where are you? There we go. Okay, so here is proof that router two, who is 10.100.100.2, has created a type three summary LSA for 10.115. How do we delete that? How do we get him to not do that? And by the way, this is a very important concept of OSPF. I can't simply go onto my area border router and say, well, hey, you know that type three summary LSA that you created that you were going to inject into area two? Don't, don't inject it, just keep it to yourself. Can't do that because once he creates the LSA, he is duty bound to flood that into the area. Because remember, if he's got an LSA in his database, even if it's one that he created himself for area two in this example, he has to flood it to everybody else so they have it as well. So the act of filtering in OSPF is actually telling your router, don't create the LSA in the first place. Don't create it. All right, so how do we get him to not create that LSA out of that information he's already learned? Well, it's a little bit more difficult here. First, we have to start by creating a prefix list. So that gets me into the, uh, the next thing I want to talk about. Just a quick overview of prefix lists in case you're not familiar with those. So in Cisco, uh, there's both IPv4 and IPv6 prefix lists. They're configured pretty much exactly the same way. So for IPv4, you just say, let me just uh, zoom in on this so you can see it a little bit better. You just say IP prefix dash list, and then you give it some descriptive name, okay? You don't have to give it a sequence number. You can if you want. Uh, but I believe they, if you have a prefix list, for example, called INE, and you have like seven or eight lines of that prefix list called INE, each one of them will be given a sequence number. They're either in increments of five or 10. I don't remember, not really relevant. So IP prefix list, we'll just call it um, deny summary, because that's what I want to do. And then in this case, we want to say deny. We could say permit or deny. So I want to deny 10.115.0 slash 24. Okay, so now if I hit the enter key right now, which is what I'm gonna do, then the way this is interpreted is he will look for, he says, okay, when I'm, I'm gonna, he says, I'm gonna look at my OSPF database. He says, oh, they're in area zero. I found a type three LSA that begins with 10,115. The first 24 bits match this, okay. And he's gonna say, all right, am I allowed? So the next thing he says is, okay, this slash 24 actually means two things when I do it like this. This means two things. Number one, it says the first 24 bits of what you're looking at have to exactly match this number. They have to match 10, 115, okay? And that you can have anything. You could have, for example, here's a creative way of doing a prefix list. Let's say I wanted to deny all class B routes. Okay, any route that is um, 128 up to 191. How would I do all that? Well, how about this? Deny 128.000 slash two, slash two. And that would basically say, hey, look, I'm going to look for any route where the first two bits are one zero. And isn't any route that begins with one zero in binary a class B? Yes, it is. So you could do that. Now, in this case, that's not what I want to do, though. I want to do 10.115.0 slash 24. Now, I said there's two uses of the slash 24. That's one. First 24 bits have to match 10.115. Now, because in this case, there's nothing after that, if I do a question mark, I could do GE or LE. But because I haven't done that, that slash 24 means also now go into the length field where the subnet mask would be. And the subnet mask has to exactly match a slash 24. So unlike our area range not advertised where that 255, 255, 255, zero was only looking at the prefix, wasn't looking at the subnet mask at all. It just said 10, 115, that's it. That's a match. 
Here, the prefix list is looking at not only the prefix, but the mask as well. Now I could say something like this, greater than or equal to 26. Now what this is saying is the, 20, the slash 24 is only referring to the prefix. It says any route where the first 24 bits are 10, 115 matches and the subnet mask has to be equal to or greater than a slash 26. So this would now match on a range of routes, starting with slash 26s all the way up to slash 32s. Or I could constrict it even further like this, saying, OK, now if the prefix is 10115, that matches. And the subnet mask has to be a slash 26 at a minimum up to a slash 29 maximum. So that's sort of how you construct a prefix list if you don't have any experience with that. Now, in this case, I just want to match the specific route of 10.115.0. So I'm going to do that. Now, if I just left it like that, watch this. So now I'm going to say router OSPF1. And I'm making a mistake here intentionally because I want to show you something. Now, in router 2, I say area. In this case, let's just say to filter dash list prefix, and then we give it the name, which was deny dash summary in. And I'll, I'll walk through this command here in just a second. Actually, let's just talk about this right now. So let me scroll down here. OK, so what this command is doing is we know that we've got area 0, and we've got area two, and our router two is sitting right here in the middle of them. Okay, he's got links like this. So by saying area two in, and this is sort of reverse thinking, but this is how they constructed the command. That means I want you to look at this prefix list called deny summary. And if there was something that is permitted in here, which there's not right now, that means you are permitted to send into area two a type three summary LSA about that route. If there's something that says deny, that means you are denied from sending into area two. Now, I could have also done it like this. I could have said, let's go back to this. Go in a little bit so you can see a little bit better. Change this to an out and change this to a zero. And now what that would mean is that would mean any routes that are coming out of area zero, they had to pass through area zero and they're com out, coming out, run them through the prefix list. These would both meet my objective. The nice thing about this command here is it gives you a lot of flexibility because let's say you had an ABR right here and he was connected to let's say three links. This link was in area zero, this link was in area one, and this link was in area two. Let's say your first objective is, hey, he just learned something from area zero, some route, whatever it is, some LSA, and you say, hey, air, router A, you can keep that to yourself, but do not send that to area one and do not send that to area two. Don't do it. Well, in that case, I'd want to do it just like this. I'd want to say area zero out. In other words, it's coming out of area zero. It stops there. It doesn't go any further. Or let's say here was my objective. Let's say once again, I learned something from area zero and I say, well, it's OK to send that into area one but it's not okay to send that into area two. Then I would use the second flavor of this command, area two in, which means I will not send it into area two. Okay. All right, so that's, man, and this, this can work on any ABR. I could have done this back on my router one as my first demonstration and it would have worked there too. But I just wanted to show you the difference. Now, the one thing about this though in Cisco land is that Remember, we're, we're referencing a prefix list here. And by default, if something is not expressly permitted in the prefix list, it will be implicitly denied. 
So right now I said, okay, deny this, but I never told him what he's allowed to do. So actually now if we go into my, my database, so this is what I have right now, area two in, if I type do show IP OSPF database, uh, summary self-originate, let's leave it like that. Okay, so this is what he's sending into area zero. We don't care about that. What is he sending into area two? Ah, nothing, right? It stopped at area zero, nothing in area two. And that's because it implicitly denied everything, not just the one thing I, I denied. So I have to make sure I add, I have to make sure I add to my prefix list a permit all statement, which looks like this. IP prefix dash list deny dash summary permit and the world of IP before the way you do a permit all is zero 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 slash zero. Now if I just left it like that, that would say the slash zero would mean we're not matching any bits on the route. That would mean basically match everything, but it would also mean and only match a route where the subnet mask is a slash zero. Well, there's only one route that's gonna have a slash zero subnet mask, your default route. So this is how you would match a default route only, but that's not what I wanna do. I wanna match everything. So now I'll say less than or equal to 32. So now the slash zero says, I don't really care about the prefix. You don't have to match anything there. All we're matching on are routes where the subnet mask is slash 32 all the way on down to a slash zero. So this is like in an access list, if you're, if you're familiar with, with that, this is like a permit any statement. And now when I look at my database, we wanna go into our area two database, here it is. So now once again, we are generating those and we should see that 15 is not in there. So we've got 12, 13, 14, but 15 is not there. All right, so show run section OSPF. So this was the other filtering command in Cisco for filtering on area border routers. And this one required that you construct a prefix list as well. So you had to know how to do that. Okay, how do we accomplish that in Juniper land? All right, let's go to our Juniper router. All right, we're gonna leave VMX1 and we're gonna go over to VMX2. Okay, here we are. Okay, so, so for this, so just like with Cisco, how in order to use that command, I had to create some sort of classification tool, which was my prefix list. It only allowed me to use a prefix list to match on. Here in Juniper land, we're not gonna create a prefix list. When you do route filtering in Juniper, and you wanna match on something, what you have to create is something called a policy statement. Um, so the way we do that, and there's a variety of ways to do that. I go into all the nitty gritty details of policy statements and policy options in my course, but here we're gonna create a fairly simple one. Um, I can't zoom in because it's gonna be a pretty long command. So we say set, once again, before I go, show, not show, run show OSPF database, net summary, advertising router, self. All right, so here we see area two, and yes, he is, he did create a type three summary LSA for the 10.115 network. Okay, so first of all, how do I match on that? Well, I say set policy-options, policy-statement, and then we give it a descriptive name. So we'll just once again say deny summary and now we give it a term and this first term is where we're going to specify what are we going to match so we can say um, from protocol OSPF so that's the first thing we have to match on OSPF next we're going to match on a route filter and I'm going to create that route filter right here 10 115.0 slash 24 exact 
okay? So this is saying, now this set policy statement is not actually doing anything. It's not taking any action. It's like a prefix list. It's just used strictly for matching purposes. So in this case, I'm matching two things. I'm matching on that whatever I'm looking for has to have come from OSPF. So it's not gonna match on ISIS or direct routes or anything. And it has to match this exact route filter of 10115 slash 24. Now this exact here, if I had done a question mark here, this would be like a prefix list, where in addition to exact, you can do greater than, less than, you can match on ranges of subnet masks. So it gives you the same options as a Cisco prefix list there. But in this case, I'm just matching on that exact route. And then now I say, okay, if it matches on those two things, what do I wanna do with it? Now remember with the prefix list, when you constructed your Cisco prefix list, there was a deny or permit statement, right? Here's the equivalent. We say then reject. Now, just like with the prefix list, they had the implicit deny all. I don't wanna deny everything here. So now I'm gonna create a second term, term two from protocol OSPF. I don't even have to create a route filter. And then I'll just say, then accept. That's like a permit all statement. And now I need to go into OSPF and tell OSPF, hey, look at this, use this. So here's how we do that. Set protocols, OSPF, area, Okay, now this is gonna be like that, that filter list command that we just looked at. So I have a choice here. I could either set the area as, now we're doing this on VMX2. Let's just move over to the Juniper topology here real quick. Come on, where are you? There we go. Ah, come on. There, okay. So we're doing this on this guy. So I could say area zero, and now <laughs> this is just sort of reverse of Cisco, right? With the, the area filter list command, if I was focusing on area zero, it would have been focusing on area zero out, right? Coming out of area zero. Here with Juniper, if I say area zero, it's gonna be in, coming in from area zero. Or if I said area two, it would be out. You know, unfortunately, it's not the same across vendors. So let's do area 0002. And now we're going to say network dash summary dash export. So it's not in or out, it's import or export. So if I had area zero here, it would have been network dash summary dash import. What am I allowed to, uh, well, said enough about that. Zero two is export. And now we want to reference that policy statement that I just created, deny summary, and then commit everything. Okay. So now if we, and I'll, I'll go back and show you those commands again real quick. So now just to confirm it worked, show OSPF database, net summary, advertising router self, and here is area two, and we can see that the 15 network is gone. It was taken out. So show configuration display set. And you can see there were quite a few more commands I had to do to make this work than what we did in the Cisco. So first I had to create all of this policy statement right there, right? Denying OSPF, if it was this route, then reject it and then accepting all other OSPF routes. And then I had to take this policy statement called deny summary. And I had to use the network summary export. Say when exporting or when sending out to area 002, run it through the policy statement called deny summary. Okay, and so that's, so, as far as ABRs are concerned, that's the, the two main filtering mechanisms that we have available to us. Now we still have some other filters available. I wanna look, run through here real quick. So the next thing is, what if you have 
a router, an OSPF router that is an autonomous system border router, an autonomous system boundary router. It's redistributing something into OSPF. And you want to say, okay, well, of this set of routes that you're redistributing, some of them I don't want you to redistribute. Don't do it. How do we prevent the ASBR from, from doing that? So let's go back to our Cisco topology. And what I'm gonna do here, let's see here. Let's, let's look on router five. Let's make him our ASBR if he's not already the ASBR. Okay, and we're just gonna do show run section OSPF. We're gonna look for the presence of the redistribute command. All right, so we have redistribute connected subnets. All right, so let's see here. Show run interface loopback zero. Okay, so let's put, um, let's create a uh, maybe uh, one more loopback interface. Show IP interface brief. Let's see what we've got here. We've got loopback zero and a loopback one. Loopback zero does not have OSPF currently on it and loopback one does. So let's go to interface loopback one, no IP OSPF one, area one. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. So right now router five has these two different loopbacks with two different subnets on it. I'm gonna have him redistribute those. Uh, actually this works better for actually doing a routing protocol. So, all right, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to router three, completely delete all OSPF. And we're gonna turn on RIP. Actually, it looks like there's already RIP between three and four. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna turn off OSPF on router four. I'm gonna go here, turn off OSPF. I'm gonna create one more loop back. And so router four is gonna be using RIP, which, is, which will be his only remaining routing protocol to advertise that to router three. And then we'll make router three, our autonomous system boundary router, who will redistribute that RIP into OSPF. So let's do that. Let's go to router four, kill his OSPF and add one more loop back. Let's just do that. Okay. No router OSPF one, boop, all dead. Okay, so now let's do um, do show IP interface brief. I think we need to add one more loop back in here. So we've got some, some variation. Interface loop back one, IP address, let's just say 4444. Exit and do show run section rip, just to make sure he's already running rip. Okay, he is, um, ba, 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 ba. he's doing the 10 network. Let's do interface loop back to IP address 44. Okay, show IP interface brief. Okay, so here on router four and I'll zoom in a little bit so you guys can see this a little bit better. So right now he's no longer running OSPF at all. I've created a couple of new loop back interfaces and these are not included in RIP. So I'm gonna have RIP um, send these out. Router RIP, redistribute connected. There we go. Okay, so now we can exit from router four. And if we go over to router three, he should have learned about those via RIP because that's the only language that he and router four are currently speaking. Show IP route rip. Yes, okay, so there we go. All right, so we got some rip routes here. So now I'm gonna make router three my autonomous system boundary router. I'm gonna tell him to redistribute rip. Router OSPF one, redistribute rip subnets. Okay, so right now he's redistributing all rip. So if I go to any OSPF router, I should now see the four and the 44 network as OSPF external routes. Like let's go over here to router five, show IP route OSPF. Let's 
and there we go. All right, so there's my OSPF external route for the four network. And then down there is my OSPF external route for the 44 network. Okay, so let's go back and see how we can do some filtering now. So now what I wanna do is I wanna tell router three, hey, it's okay to redistribute that four network from RIP, but I don't want you to redistribute that 44 network from RIP. How do I do that? So in router four, not router four, router three, he's my ASBR, I'm gonna use a, a filtering command that you commonly see in distance vector protocols and in BGP, which is called the distribute list command. And the distribute list has directionality, has in or out. In this case, we're gonna be doing out. All right, so just like with my area filter list command, how I had to reference some sort of a classification tool, which in that case was a prefix list. My distribute list also has to reference a classification tool. Now here I've got a little bit more options though when it comes to a distribute list. Router OSPF1 distribute dash list question mark. Okay, so here with my distribute list, I could configure another prefix list, but I've already shown you guys how to do that. Um, so let's do something a little bit different. I'm gonna have my distribute list reference a route map and then have my route map in turn reference an access list. All right, so I have to configure those, first, those things first. So let's start with, actually before I start with anything, I have to sort of talk about the, the theory of how these things work. Okay, so here's my OSPF. Sorry for my bad handwriting. And I'm gonna have a distribute list. Distribute list, which is referencing a route map, RM, route map. Okay, so just like my prefix list had a permit or deny statement, my route map is gonna have a permit or deny statement. If my route map matches something and that route map sequence says permit, that means the distribute list will distribute it. It will hand it out, right? That's what distribution is, right? To give away something, to hand something out. So the distribute list will not filter. It will permit it. If my route map matches on something and then the route map sequence says deny, that means my distribute list will not be allowed. It will be denied from distributing. It will filter. So I'm gonna have to create a route map and route maps are given sequence numbers just like prefix lists. And here I'm gonna have a permit or deny statement. So in this case, I'll have a deny statement. So let's just go ahead and create the route map while I'm here. So just showing you my chicken scratch. So route dash map, let's just call it uh, once again, deny summary. Actually, it's not summary. Let's just say deny external in this case, deny 10. Okay, so now I'm in route map configuration mode. So the next thing I have to do is I have to say, what am I gonna match on? Now, one great thing about route maps is, remember how I said at the beginning of our webinar today, I said, one of the things you have to decide on is what are you gonna match on? Are you gonna match on the prefix, the subnet mask, or something completely non-IP, like the route type, or the neighbor that you learned it from? All of those things can be matched with route maps. You see, prefix lists, access lists, all they can match on are either the route or the subnet mask. That's it. Route maps can match on a whole range of things. So for example, if I do match question mark right here, you can see lots of different stuff. Now, not all of this stuff is relevant, right? For example, MPLS label, I'm not doing MPLS. So that, that wouldn't mean anything to OSPF. Uh, RPKI, you know, it, it wouldn't. So I have to know in advance, what match things can I match on that OSPF can understand? So in this case, I'm actually gonna match on an access list. So I should probably configure the access list first. So we'll come back to that route map. So let's just use a standard access list, access list one. Now, in an access list, just like a prefix list, you have a permit or deny statement. And here's where things get a little bit tricky because, let's do this. So I've got a route map and it's sequence number 10 and it's, going to be deny. OK, 
Okay, so anything that that route map sequence matches on will be denied from distribution. The distribute list will filter it out. Now, and then when I'm, before I leave the route map, I'm gonna create another sequence of let's say 20 and I'm gonna permit that because once again, I don't wanna filter everything out, just the things I'm looking for. Okay, now the route map sequence, we talked about how that has to match on something. Now, by the way, if you leave out the match keyword, that means match everything. So, and that's actually what I'm gonna do down here. I'm just gonna say route map 20 permit and not have anything else, which will mean match all. Now in this case, I'm gonna match on something. In this case, I could either match on an ACL and that's what I'm gonna do, or I could also match on a prefix list if I wanted to. So here comes the, the ACL. Now here's where things get a little bit tricky. The ACL, or if I did a prefix list, those also have deny or permit statements as well. Deny or permit. Now, if an access list or prefix list says permit and the route map is using that access list or prefix list, that means the route map is permitted to do whatever it wants to do. And that's what I wanna do here. I wanna say, let's go ahead and go back to this. Access list one, and I'll zoom in so you can see a little bit better. Access list one, permit 44, 44, 44, zero, and then a wildcard mask instead of a subnet mask. Okay. And then let's go back to my route map. which I named that. So route dash map, deny dash external, deny 10, match IP address one. That's matching my access list number one. And now I'm gonna create one more sequence of my route map, which is gonna be permit 20. So let me show you what I've configured so far and, and walk you through the explanation of this. Okay, this is good enough. Okay, so I haven't finished my distribute list in OSPF yet, but let's just imagine that that was there. So OSPF has a distribute list saying, hey, when you're redistributing RIP, first run it through this route map called deny external. Okay, so what OSPF would do is say, okay, I've got all these RIP routes here. Before I convert them into OSPF external LSAs, I need to look for this route map called deny external and start with the lowest sequence number I can find, which is 10. It says, okay, what's sequence number 10 telling me to do? It says, take these routes that I've got via RIP and match them against access list number one. Oh, here's access list number one. And uh, oh yeah, this matches one of my routes, 4444.0. So because this access list says permit, that means this sequence of the route map is permitted to do what it wants to do, which in this case, it's permitted to deny which sounds kind of weird, but that's what it's doing. So now the ax, the route map will report back to OSPF, say, hey, um, that 44, 44, 44, you are denied from redistributing that. You can't do it. Now, what if instead I had put a deny here in my access list? That would have been wrong. And let's see what that would have done. So if I'm working through my first sequence of the route map, it says, okay, I'm gonna match access list one. Oh, here's an access list that says, let's say deny 44. He says, okay, this matches, but because I have a deny here, I'm denied from doing what this sequence wants to do. Roll over to the next sequence. Is there another sequence? So he says, okay, I'm done with sequence 10. I can't, can't deny it. So now I have to roll over to, oh, here it is, sequence number 20. And because sequence number 20 is essentially matching everything, because I did not put a match statement in there, that means match everything, that would in, in essence tell the distribute list, you are permitted to redistribute the 4444 network. So you see how that works? In my route map sequence, if I'm matching on a prefix list or an access list, and if that prefix list or access list does match what I'm looking for, but it says deny in the prefix list or access list, that means this sequence of the route map is finished, 
over, kaput, move on to the next one. Now you say, well, Keith, what if there wasn't a next one? What if I had not configured number 20? Well, just like the prefix list has an implicit deny at the end, which means, hey, if you don't specifically permit something, everything's gonna match at the end and be dropped, filtered. Same thing is true here of my route map, and that's why I needed to configure this. If I had not configured this, anything that did not match sequence number 10 would roll over to my implicit deny and everything would be filtered. So now I just have to actually put that route, that distribute list into my OSPF statement. Router OSPF1 distribute dash list route dash map and it's called deny dash external. And now I say, um, oh, hold on. It's distribute dash list out. Yep. Um, what are you doing? Distribute dash list. I am in OSPF, right? Distribute list. Route dash map. Deny dash external. Something is strange here. Distribute list out. Okay, let me tell you why I'm on, I'm on pause here for a second. And maybe they changed, or maybe I'm just not doing this right. So in OSPF, when you do an outbound distribute list, it's only applicable on an ASBR, somebody who's redistributing something like RIP or ISIS or EIGRP. And what I expected to see here is part of the distribute list out command is a spot where it gives me a, a place to reference the protocol, like distribute list out RIP, route map, blah, or distribute list out EIGRP, route map, blah. And something is not working here. Yeah, distribute list. I think we are experiencing a bug here because there should be another option here after this. And I keep getting the same thing. And I, I don't want to do an inbound distribute list. I definitely want to do an outbound distribute list. Router OSPF1. Distribute dash list. Route dash map. I'll just put in something. Test. Yeah, something is... Either they stripped it out of the code or this particular router in Cisco Modeling Labs, this particular image doesn't contain that as an option. That's a bummer that I can't show you that. Well, trust me, there are routers in OSPF that support the distribute list out command. And it would be distribute dash list, route dash map, deny whatever, out rip. So that's that's the command I was trying to type in. I know I haven't made it up. I'll just type it in here. I'm sorry that you know I probably I didn't have a chance to test every single one of these commands, but it would be router. Uh, someone's asking if I can try this with the ACL. Sure. Yeah. Let's just see if if the problem is with that. Distribute dash list. See right here, it should be giving me the option of specifying access list, prefix list, distribute list one out. Ah, good catch. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, but good catch. So it looks like we can't use our route map, which kind of stinks, um, but I can still finish the demonstration with this anyway. So distribute list prefix test. Okay, so good. Hey, it's been a while, I learned something too. So what we've just learned here is that with an outbound distribute list on an ASBR, you can only match on an access list or a prefix list. You can't match on a route map, which is kind of silly. So let's make this work so that it will work. So let's just go ahead and exit do show IP access dash list. So what we'll do is we'll just change this. No 
access-list1, and now let's say access-list1 deny 444440. And we don't want to filter out everything, so we'll put in a permit any statement after that. Now, router OSPF1, distribute-list1 out rip. And I'll get rid of my route map just so it's not in there causing confusion. OK, so here is our final configuration. It's a shame it doesn't let us match on a route map because we have so much more flexibility with those. All right, so here I have OSPF. I'm redistributing RIP subnets, but I'm qualifying that. I'm controlling that with my outbound distribute list statement, which in this case is using access list number one, which is down here, which will say, okay, you are denied from redistributing the 4444 network. You're permitted to redistribute everything else. So now when I do show IP OSPF database um, external self-originate, because he's creating external LSAs when he does the redistribution, there's the four network. Uh, and then here's some other, we must have a connected route or something in there or, oh no, okay. And 44, ah, oh, okay. So this is why it's not matching. 44 slash eight. Okay, so my access, this isn't gonna work because my access list was matching on the 44, 44, 44 network, but yeah, okay, so RIP summarized it to this. That's fine. Um, Access-list one, deny 44, 0, 0, 0, 0 0.255, 255, 255. Okay, so the four network and the 44 network should not be in here. 44, okay, why are you in there? Another troubleshooting opportunity. It might just be because I'm too fast, let's see. In other words, maybe it just hasn't, hasn't had time to purge it yet. Let's just do our troubleshooting and then we'll finish up and I'll show you how to do this on Juniper as well. Oh, <laughs> it's because the order in which access lists, uh, so access lists parse top down. So this 44 is coming after my permit any, so it's not even being hit at all. Ah, oh, you're so difficult. Okay, no access dash list one. All right, then we'll just copy this one in here. And then we'll just copy this one in here. Okay, that should have fixed the problem. Same thing is true of prefix lists, by the way. If you're matching on prefix lists, the order in which the prefix lists are configured and show up, it does parse from the top down. All right, there's the four network. And the 44 network is gone. All right, so I know I ran through a lot of that stuff really fast there. Let's just real quickly look at the config one more time. And then we'll finish up by demonstrating this on the Juniper. And that, that'll probably be about the end of it. Then we'll take some questions. Okay. So once again, here's OSPF. This guy is an ASBR because he's redistributing RIP but I'm controlling that outbound redistribution of RIP with my distribute list, which is referencing access list one. We learned it could have also referenced a prefix list, but not a route map. And access list one is saying, when you're doing redistribution, deny that RIP route of 44 slash eight, permit everything else. Woo, all right. Wow, there was a lot involved with that. Okay, so how do we do this in the world of Juniper? And then we'll figure that out. So that's actually going to be easier in Juniper. Let's see here. What can we do with Juniper now? Um, let's see here. I think we got some same things going on. RIP is going on here. So I should be able to do the same thing. Disable on VMX4 all my OSPF. So let's go to VMX4.
All right, delete protocols OSPF. Okay, and let's just add some additional stuff to his loopback interface, set interfaces. Um, another difference is that, you know, on when you're doing labbing and stuff, like I've been doing, Cisco routers make it easy because if you want to just say, hey, I just want to add like four or five additional subnets to this router to give them something to advertise, to play around with. You can just create multiple loopback interfaces, loopback zero, loopback one, loopback two. Juniper routers don't let you do that. Uh, they only support one loopback interface, but that one loopback interface does support multiple addresses, which is what I'm going to do right here. So set interfaces, LO zero, unit zero, family, INET, address, and let's just make this 44, 44, 44.0 slash, oh, dot four slash 24. Commit. Okay. Um, and let's see here. Show, let's just see what RIP is currently advertising in this guy. Okay, uh, RIP is already active on my loopback, so I should be good to go. So I should be able to leave this guy now and go over to router three, just like we did on the Cisco side. Okay, show route table inet. And there it is, okay. Ah, oh, he learned it via ISIS. Um, that's, that's fine. We can do this with ISIS as well. That's not going to hurt anything. Uh, okay, so notice here we see that the 44 network has been learned via both ISIS and RIP. The little asterisk is telling us that the ISIS route is the preferred route, but that's fine. We can still do the same thing whether we're filtering ISIS or, or RIP. So the steps are, are fairly similar. We have to create something that's gonna be adoring our classification. And once again, that's a policy options. We're gonna do our policy option policy statement. Okay, so we're gonna do, and uh, before I do this, show protocols. Uh, so OSPF currently is not exporting ISIS at all. So let's get him to do that. Set policy-options, policy-statement. I will just say OSPF redistribution, term one from protocol ISIS. And then we'll say then accept, and now I'll do set protocols OSPF export. So this is how you do redistribution in the world of Juniper. They don't have a redistribute keyword, it's the export keyword. And actually the export keyword is used for multiple things. Uh, it's used to do redistribution, like in this case, I'm gonna say set OSPF export, and I'm gonna reference my OSPF redistribution, commit that. So now what I've done is I've said, okay, OSPF, you are allowed to export whatever routes are matched in the policy statement called OSPF redistribution. And I made that very simple. I said, basically, just look for anything that's from ISIS and accept it. So it should be doing that. So run show OSPF database um, external advertising router self. And there we can see, right? He's advertising these as external LSAs. Now that export keyword is also used for filtering. So in this particular case, if I wanna filter out the 4444.0, I don't have to change anything about this. All I have to do is add another line to my policy statement. So let's do that. Term one from route dash filter 44, 44, 44 
slash 24 exact. And now I'm going to want to delete this line that says except. Delete that. And I'm going to want to put it back in as a reject. OK. So, so far, let me show you what I've done. OK, so within OSPF, I've said you are allowed to export in Cisco, that'd be redistribute anything that's permitted by the OSPF redistribution policy statement. OK, so if we go up here right now, that policy statement says, OK, if it's from ISIS and if it matches 44, 44, 44, 0, then reject it. But I don't have any permit statements right now, so he's not redistributing anything. So I have to now do this, term two from protocol ISIS, and term two, then accept. Up, uh, then commit everything, exit. Okay, so show configuration. Display set. Okay, so, and then I'll show you, we'll verify this is working and then that'll be it and we'll take any residual questions you guys have. Okay, so OSPF now is looking at this policy statement. I'll zoom in a little bit here. There we go. Um, called OSPF redistribution. The first term, and think of a term as being like, if you're familiar with Cisco, how like a prefix list has sequence 10 or an access list has sequence 10. This is like a sequence. Term one is like a sequence and then term two is a second sequence and it is processed in order. So term number one says, okay, you are allowed to export or redistribute, we could say, anything from ISIS if it matches this route filter, but if it does, you reject it. So this is saying, do not reject, do not export that route. And then term two says, anything else that you learn via ISIS will accept it. And so now if I look in my OSPF database, show OSPF database, external advertising router self. Now we can see, so this is a host route right here. So this is a slash 32, but the 44, 44, 44.0 gone. That has been filtered out. All right, so I didn't know how much we would get through today, but that's, we've gone for about an hour and a half. Um, if your eyes aren't already glazed over, <laughs> I'm at risk that they would be if I kept going on. So I think that is as far as we're gonna go with the demonstrations. Once again, um, go to my course there at myine.com, goes through all of this. It also goes through RIP, EIGRP, ISIS, um, and it also costs about redistribution as well. It's not just filtering. It talks about how to redistribute between protocols. Woo. Okay. So let's take a little bit of time here and answer some of your outstanding questions. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for bearing with me there through uh, a couple of glitches that we had to deal with. All right. Um, can you please put up the, the Cisco OSPF slide? Okay. Um, in case you didn't capture that already, that was this. Okay, so that was that. There you go, David, if you didn't have a chance to capture that. Um, so Ricardo asked, does that affect any other ABRs in area one? Okay, and you asked that at about 11.23, so probably at about that time, I was showing either the area range not advertise or the area filter list command. And the answer would be no. So if on one particular ABR, you suppress him from creating an LSA, like with that area range not advertise or that area filter list, that only affects him. So if there's another ABR in the same area he's connected to, that other ABR is still allowed to do what he's gonna do. So he can still create his summary LSAs. 
All right. Um, <laughs> yep, John was pointing out my typos of which there were quite a few. Let's see. In the OSPF route filtering, isn't term two redundant since policies permit by default? So Ricardo made a, a good point. So when I was on the Juniper routers and I was configuring my policy statements, my first policy statement typically was rejecting whatever I wanted to reject. And then I configured a second term to basically permit anything. And Ricardo's correct. You know, um, mo vast majority of time, there, this is another distinction between Cisco and Juniper. And I have this in my course, is that in Cisco land, a lot of times if you don't specify a permit statement, everything is dropped by default. And in Juniper, it's just the opposite. Um, in other words, everything is permitted by default. So he was saying, hey, why did you configure that second term, which is permitting everything when it, that's kind of the default behavior? A, a way I look at it is that, you know, you might not know what the default behavior is. I forgot what the default behavior was until you just pointed out to me, Ricardo. So thank you for that. So there's no harm in creating that second term permitting everything, even if it's the default behavior. As a matter of fact, somebody reading through your configuration it'll be a lot clearer to them now what you are trying to accomplish and you're not relying on your reader to know what the defaults are. So no harm in doing it, but you're right. It was there by default. Okay, so I think I've answered your questions, Ricardo. It was even better with the glitches. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoyed my failures, David. That's that's great. All right, so Brian, let's see here. The Brian asks, is there a difference in the way the route is installed on the routing table or advertised to the neighbor if the OSPF area is configured on the interface or the network statement is used inside the OSPF process? No, nope, no difference, no difference at all. Um, so what Brian was pointing out was that when I was adding OSPF area two, I was going onto the interface and I was using the IP OSPF one area two command. And Brian was remembering that you could also go into the OSPF process and type a network statement. They both do exactly the same thing. Um, I like using the interface command for two reasons. Number one, uh, it's shorter, right? I don't have to worry about wildcard masks. So that's a little bit easier. And the other thing is, is that if I configured on the interface, if I go back to that interface later on and I change the IP address to something else, that OSPF command is still relevant. It's still on the interface. But if I had gone to my OSPF process and you know, let's say for example, that I went on to this interface right here and an OSPF on this router, not the interface, but let's say I went into this router and in order to activate OSPF, I use the network statement for network 26. And then later on, I change this to like, you know, 9.9.9.9 or something like that. Then that OSPF network statement wouldn't be doing anything anymore because it would be old, it'd be outdated. So that's another reason I like putting it right on the interface. But they don't affect the processing of OSPF at all. All right, so let's see here. Um, and then German says, I saw that on the ASBR you used the distribute list, but for filtering on the ABR you did not. Any reason for that? Absolutely. Um, because the distribute list only controls the creation or suppression of external LSAs. That's it. Uh, it, has, it does not have any validity, any ability to control or suppress type three summary LSAs. So for that, you have to use either the area range not advertise or the area filter list and vice versa. If I was on an ASBR, area range not advertise or area filter list would not affect that ASBR as far as what he's allowed to redistribute or not. Only the distribute list command does that. Very good question. Um, and yes, uh, you could do redistribute connected as well. That's, that's also, okay, so, yep, so, so Christoph, we, we found out together that the outbound distribute list only worked with access lists and prefix lists, 
didn't work with route maps. And Brian asks, when does an OSPF route get installed as an external type one route? Okay, well, that doesn't happen by default. Uh, the way that that would happen, I can just demonstrate that real quick, is here on router three. Let's take a look at his OSPF. Okay, so I've said redistribute RIP subnets. So you can see if I type show IP OSPF database external self-originate. So I'll zoom in here. By default, these will go out as type five AS external LSAs. And in the body of the LSA, there's like a subtype, which in this case will be, where does it show it? Right here. It shows up as metric type two, right? And so what that means is that as an ASBR, I'm going to put my default metric on there. Like if I'm Cisco, I'm going to put a default cost of 20 on these redistributed RIP routes. And I'm going to send it out to you and everybody behind you. Now, if you get this as a type five with a subtype two, that means you are not allowed to change the cost. You can't even factor in what it costs you to reach me. Irrelevant. So when you put this into your routing table, if I did a cost of 20 when I redistributed it, that's what's got to show up in your routing table as 20. You're not allowed to change that. But as the ASBR, I have the ability to control that. I could say, hey, I'm going to send this out as a metric type one, which means I'll give you my original cost of 20, but you're allowed to take that and add on to it whatever the cost is to reach me to come up with the total cumulative cost. Now you see, it doesn't do that by default. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can do that. The easiest way is in the redistribute command itself, which would be to configure this, router OSPF one and redistribute rip subnets. And here you, you would use the metric dash type keyword and just say, one. So that's how that's that's one way you could do it right within the redistribute command itself metric dash type. Another way you could do it is your redistribute command could be referencing a route map. And in the route map itself, how we talked about how you can have match things like match this prefix list match this access list. Well, the route map sequence can also have set commands where you can say, okay, now I'm gonna modify or change the characteristics of this thing that I've matched. So one of the set commands in your sequence could be set um, metric dash type, type dash one. And that would have the exact same effect as what you have here. That would give you a little bit more granularity. Like let's say of all my rip routes, I wanna redistribute half of them as type twos and the other half as type ones. Well, then my redistribute command would have to reference a route map in one sequence would match on the first group and then set metric dash type type one. And then the second sequence of my route map would match on the other grouping of routes and then say set metric dash type type dash two. So that's how you would change the types. Great question. All right. And then we have a question here from Anthony. If you deny a route in OSPF, so the route will not, actually, let me, I'm going blind here. Let me put it over here. If you deny a route in OSPF, so the route will not be added to the fib of the router is being denied to. Will that router still advertise the next router as it will be in its link state database? Okay, so Anthony, you're talking about one thing I was, I was planning on getting to, but I didn't have time to get to. Um, so what Anthony is referring to is we, the last thing we talked about was a distribute list out command. Now in OSPF, there is also a distribute list in command. And in, with Cisco, we're talking about what the distribute list in command says, it says, okay, take all the LSAs I have on my database. And instead of just naturally converting those into routes in my routing table, I'm going to control that. So that's what distribute list in does. So you could say, all right, I've got all these LSAs and one of the LSAs I have in my database is for the 88.88 .88 network. For whatever reason, 
I don't want that as a route in my local routing table. So I would create like an access list or a prefix list denying that. And then in OSPF, I would say distribute list, access list, distribute list prefix in. And now that LSA would still be in my database. I can't get it out of there, but it would not be permitted as a route in my routing table. Now, Anthony, you're absolutely right. If that LSA is in my database, that means I was duty bound to flood it to all the other routers in my own area. So you gotta be really careful with that distribute list in command because let's say you have a situation like this, router one, router two, router three, and router four. And let's say they're all connected like this. Okay. And let's say there's network X down here. So it, it's advertised as an LSA, router one advertise it to two, two advertise it to three, three advertise it to four. So they've all got it in their database. So all these routers have the SPF common tree. They all know of each other's existence. They all know how they're interconnected and they all know that network X exists out there. So naturally um, router four, when he installs that LSA as a route in his routing table, he's gonna point to router three as the next hop. Router three is gonna point to router two. Route two is gonna to point to router one. Now, if I did the distribute list in command in router three, that would basically mean that router three is prevented from having that route. So he would not have that route in his routing table, but that does not affect routers one, two, or four. So router four would still have the route in his routing table. He'd still be pointing to router three. So that means that if router four ever actually gets some IP packets, which are going to network X, he's gonna forward those packets to router three and then router three is gonna drop them because his inbound distribute list prevented him from having that route in his table. So you gotta be real careful about when you use that because it could cause a black holing of traffic like we see here. Now, Juniper has something similar uh, with Juniper instead of using the set protocol OSPF export, it's set protocol OSPF import, but there's a catch with Cisco that distribute list in will pretty much match on any LSA and prevent it from becoming a route. It doesn't matter if it was learned as a type one LSA, type two, type three, doesn't matter what it is. With Juniper, if you do the OSPF import command, that is only looking at external LSAs. So as far as I can tell, there's no way on a Juniper router once he receives an LSA, unless it's an external, there's no way to prevent him from putting that in his routing table as a route. I haven't found it anyway. Great question. All right. I think that answers all of the questions that there have been. Fantastic. So thank you everybody for staying with me throughout this. Thank you for your great, great questions. I hope this was very informative for you. I hope it whetted your appetite to learn about more so you can go see my course, which has a lot more gory details. And with that, I will go ahead and shut off the Zoom session. And uh, like Catherine said at the beginning, this has been recorded. So by the end of this week, um, all of you who registered should be getting a link to the recording and it will be placed on YouTube. All right, so thank you everybody for that and have a great rest of your week.